Hi, hello, welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv, the woman who really loves to hate, or at least critique, these so-called heroes. Before I dive into today's story, though, I just want to pour my whole heart out to the people of Greece and Turkey and everywhere in the region that's dealing with these horrific wildfires. I've seen a video of Evia ablaze and heard of the fires close to Athens, let alone all the others. It's so scary and sad and tragic and just fuck. Anyway, climate change is fucking real and the corporations are to blame, not the individuals. Down with late stage capitalism and the billionaires take themselves to space for no fucking reason and putting all the CO2 and imaginable into the atmosphere while we sit here feeling bad for using single use plastic. They're to blame. The climate fires are real. They hit my province, my country every year and every year they're worse and worse. Don't let anyone tell you they're not getting worse because of climate change. Billionaires are inherently immoral and just, I don't even know what more to say. Jeff Bezos deserves the worst fate Tartarus has to offer. Move aside, Tantalus. Let me introduce you to Bezos. I'm just, I'm sorry, Greece and Turkey. From someone in the Pacific Northwest, where wildfires are always common, but in the last five years have become nonstop and horrifying and destructive like no other time in my life, I know just a fraction of what you're experiencing. I hope your heat wave abates and the fires get controlled and the damage is minimal. And now I have to transform my tone because Perseus' story is lighthearted, Medusa's murder aside. Now we're back again today with more Perseus, a man who is really quite complex, at least when it comes to ancient Greek heroes. First, he's one of the most ancient, and I think that's important. Second, he really does do some heroic stuff. He has good intentions. He does mostly good things. He's an interesting one, and I'm going to try to look at him under that lens. Perseus is no Theseus. He's no Jason. We don't really need to hate him outright, and I think that alone is worth looking at more closely. Where we last left this one of the most ancient heroes of Greek mythology, he was setting out on his hero's quest in search of a gorgon's head to bring back to Polydectes because of, possibly, a very stupid comment made by a mouthy young man, Perseus himself. Note, not Medusa's head, specifically. He's in search of, simply, a gorgon's head. It's because Medusa's mortal that it will end up being hers. Hermes helps Perseus, giving him what he needs to get on his way, if not bringing him to the first location entirely. Or the gods join him later, tough to say. Regardless, the first location of this quest is the Grey Eye. Three old women, always old, born old, who share one eye and one tooth between them. They have information on the Gorgons and the Hesperides and live almost as far west at the very edge of the earth because Gaia drops off into earth encircling Oceanus. This is episode 136. Perseus at the Edge of the World, The Many Daughters of Forcus and Keto. The Grey Eye are some of my most favorite beings of all of Greek mythology, and not only because they were the inspiration for the visual representation of the fates in Disney's Hercules. These three women don't take part in any stories I know of beyond this. They don't have any kind of important role in the mythology or really any role at all beyond this moment. Still, we know their parentage. They are also three daughters of Forcus and Keto, two sea monster deities and the parents of the three Gorgon sisters. This makes all six of these creatures sisters in their own way, and daughters of these primordial sea creature beings. But none of them are explicitly connected to the sea themselves, beyond the note I had last week that the Grey Eye were said to personify the sea foam. The connection of the six, though, lends itself primarily to the name of Aeschylus' lost play that I mentioned at the end of last episode— The Forkides means the children of Forcus, and thus refers not only to the Gorgons, but the Grey Eye too. 
Anyway, the genealogy and visuals of Greek mythology is wildly entertaining and often super weird. Like, why do these women only have one eye and one tooth between them? What did this add to the story beyond a mechanism for Perseus? There is no reasoning, no background. They just have this very weird, very unique quirk. So Perseus arrives at the home of the Grey Eye, and he's there to find out the next location on his quest. He's looking for the home of the Hesperides, also referred to as just the Nymphi here. They are nymphs, after all. And according to both Pherakides and the much later Apollodorus, who almost definitely used Pherakides as a source, Perseus is looking for the Hesperides because they possess things that he needs, which is where the chronology and logistics of Perseus's quest gets a bit murkier. What do the Hesperides have? They might have the winged sandals of Hermes, but if they did, then how did Perseus get to the Grey Eye in the first place? They all live very far away from Seraphos. They're also said to have a kibisis that he needs, a backpack-style bag for him to store the Gorgon's head when he gets it. So maybe they just have that, and Perseus already had the sandals. (sighs) <sighs> trying to understand the stories that exist only in fragments and references and analyses over many hundreds of years of sources and lost things and uh, the confusion, the madness, I love it so much. Still, Perseus is searching for the Hesperides and he knows that the Grey Eye will be able to tell him where they are. He finds the Grey Eye, but it's not as easy as him just asking these three old women where he might find the Hesperides. These ladies stick together. They're not about to just give up the location of the nymphs who live so close to them. They all live on that world's edge, that furthest western world of deities, and sometimes even beyond it. The Grey Eye refuse to tell Perseus where the Hesperides are, so he does the only thing he can think of. Perseus takes the single eye and the single tooth of the Grey Eye hostage. He holds on to their precious limbs? Would we call these limbs? I imagine not. They're important, though, however you want to phrase these particular vital body parts. Perseus takes the eye and the tooth hostage, and he tells the Grey Eye that he will return the items only if the ladies tell him where he can find the Hesperides. And well, the Grey Eye tell him, and who can blame them? I mean, again, a single eye and a single tooth shared between three sisters means those items hold an awful lot of value. So I imagine the Grey Eye make a silent apology to the Hesperides for giving up their location, and they indicate somehow to Perseus that they'll give in, because of course they can't actually tell him the location until he's returned their tooth. But he does, and they tell him. And so, next up, the land of the Hesperides. But first, a fascinating variation I've found. As I've mentioned now with quite a bit of frustration, there's a lost Aeschylus play about the death of Medusa called The Four Kitties. Because it was a play, Aeschylus was limited on how much he could include, and he needed to keep it to one location. So he chose to set it all alongside the Grey Eye, since they, along with the Gorgons, were these Four Kitties, these children of Forcus. In Aeschylus, the Grey Eye are actually more like protectors of the Gorgons. They guard the women and stand up against Perseus in that respect, rather than just directing him to the next location. In Aeschylus, Perseus intercepts their shared eye and throws it into a nearby lake. Once he's done this, they can no longer watch over the Gorgons. It seems, too, that Aeschylus might not have invented this bit, and it might have existed in further sources, this idea at least of the Grey Eye being permanently blinded by Perseus in his attempts to kill Medusa. Still, according to the more standardized versions of Perseus, still, yes, next up, the Hesperides. The Hesperides were daughters of the goddess of the night, Nyx. The three nymph goddesses of the sunset, the evening, basically just the idea of the sun setting into the western horizon. And so they lived on that western horizon, near to where the Titan Atlas holds the very heavens up on his shoulders. Now, a quick aside, because I'm in the midst of learning modern Greek and I'm absolutely obsessed with the words that I can find historical or mythological connections with, so here's your single word modern Greek lesson for the day. 
Kalispera means good evening, with spera clearly coming from the same ancient Greek root word that gives us Hesperides. Anyway, I fucking love learning Greek. It's super fun. The role of the Hesperides in Perseus' story comes primarily from Pseudo-Apollodorus. He was writing quite late in terms of Greek mythology, but he also put together so many details that were in other sources that he had read, but in what we have now were are otherwise left out or super fragmentary. So it's really interesting to see what he has added to the myths based on sources he had that we don't. Or in some cases, did he make it up? So did he make it up or was it from some older source he was referencing that we don't have? Again, fucking fascinating. I could go on. Regardless, I just enjoy the Hesperides and I prefer the idea that Perseus actually had to complete an entire quest, actually had to put in some work and go to all these locations before he was able to just take Medusa's head from off her body, thus spawning a lifetime of shitty takes about the badass Gorgon lady on the internet. So Perseus goes seeking the Hesperides. Now, in the story of Heracles, he also had to visit the Hesperides for one of their famous golden apples. Because you see, these Hesperides, along with a super fucking wild dragon, and in their garden they grew golden apples. Still, because much of the details of this bit of story come only from Apollodorus, we don't know whether Perseus had any trouble getting the items from the Hesperides, whether he had to fight the dragon, or whether the dragon was even there. We just know Perseus retrieved from the Hesperides some of those godly gifts that he would need in order to continue seeking out and ultimately kill one of the Gorgon sisters. From the Hesperides, Perseus got the kibisis, the backpack of sorts that would carry the poor woman's head. He got the winged sandals, if he didn't have those already. And he got Hades's helmet of invisibility. Though, as another source asked, why didn't Hades have his helmet of invisibility? With all of these godly items, all of this divine intervention, all of this help, Perseus is now ready to travel to the final location, the Gorgons. You know, three women who don't seek out any trouble and are only ready to defend themselves against attackers. With the winged sandals of Hermes, Perseus flies off towards the Gorgons. It's interesting to wonder where they are in terms of the Hesperides, but it isn't totally clear in the mythology. They might be beyond the edge of night. But all three of these trios of women, and that there's three Grey Eye, three Hesperides, and three Gorgons is fascinating in itself— all three of these trios live at this western edge of the world in one place or another. I'd love to understand how they visualized it all. I know it was kind of a disc with an edge that dropped off into that earth-encircling river Oceanus, but where was everyone? Perseus flitted off towards the Gorgons, further along the western edge, perhaps, or just closer to Oceanus. In Oceanus, some say, or at the very edge of night itself. Regardless, they're far enough away that Perseus has to fly there, decked out in his winged sandals, his helmet of invisibility, and with his kibisis flung over his back. And with that, finally, he finds the three Gorgon sisters, Medusa, Stheno, and Euryale. The Gorgons who dwell beyond glorious ocean in the frontier lands towards night, where are the clear-voiced Hesperides, Stheno and Euryale and Medusa who suffered a woeful fate. She was mortal, but the two were undying and grew not old. With her lay the dark-haired one in a soft meadow amid spring flowers." How many times have I read you all that passage from Hesiod? Fuck, it's been a lot. But you know what? I really don't care because I truly just want to drill in these earliest opinions on Medusa, this earliest textual description of her. Because that was from Hesiod's Theogony, the earliest surviving mention of Medusa in text. She's just a gorgon, just a mortal gorgon. And whatever a gorgon looked like is not even described. She's a mortal who, quote-unquote, lay with Poseidon. Again, whatever that means, consensual or not. 
That was all she was, and that made her Perseus's target, just the simple fact that she was mortal. She was a mortal Gorgon, and her sisters were not mortal. They couldn't be killed. I wish I knew why. Nobody seems to ever explain why Medusa is the only mortal, but still, that is why Perseus went for her over anyone else. And Perseus did. He arrived where the Gorgons lived at the edge of the world, and the gods Hermes and Athena accompanied him on that leg of the journey. They provided even more divine help in this quest. He found where the Gorgons lived, and they were sleeping. The gods directed Perseus to the only one of the three Gorgons who he could physically kill, Medusa, and they warned him that he wasn't to look her in the eye. Either he looked away, or if he did have that reflective shield of later myths, he looked there instead, using it as a mirror. And while the three Gorgons were sleeping soundly in the comfort of their own home, where they felt safe and protected, he cut off Medusa's head, stored it away in his kibisus, and got the hell out of there. Not at all heroic. To continue my quoting of Hesiod's Theogony, the oldest surviving source for this moment, quote, And when Perseus cut off her head, there sprang forth great Chryseor and the horse Pegasus, who was so called because he was born near the spring Pegai of Ocean, and that other because he held a golden blade, Aor, in his hands. As you all probably well remember, Medusa's death is what triggers the birth of her children, Pegasus and Chryseor. Their father was Poseidon, hence why one of them is a horse. And something about Medusa's decapitation is what causes their birth. It's a fascinating bit, ripe with ways to interpret Medusa's relationship with Poseidon. To me, it only enforces the fact that I take it as an assault, even though Hesiod doesn't say as much. He doesn't say anything at all, and gods know Poseidon was rarely dealing in consensual encounters, and besides, if it was consensual in a godly act, why would she only be able to give birth when she was killed? And remember, the version where Athena has cursed Medusa with her so-called monstrosity is unique to Ovid, at least in terms of what survives, but the assault of Poseidon and the children born of that are not. After the death of Medusa and the birth of her children, the famous flying horse Pegasus, who was absolutely not ridden by Perseus, and Chrysior, a man who we never really hear from again, Medusa's sisters chase after Perseus, defending their sister, trying to avenge their sister. But Perseus has the gods' help, and either by speed or invisibility or simply divine intervention, Perseus escapes the pursuit of the Gorgon sisters. Another of the earliest surviving sources for the idea of a Gorgon and Perseus taking her head, though not named as Medusa, comes from a work called The Shield of Heracles, originally attributed to Hesiod, but I think I've heard that that's up for debate. Regardless, it's seriously old, archaic Greek 6th century old, and it describes a bit of this moment. The context is that all of this was actually carved into the shield carried by Heracles, because this, this epic itself is about Heracles, though not all of it survives. And it being about Heracles, it also includes a very detailed description of what imagery appeared on that hero's shield. That in itself makes this even more fun. And so yes, Perseus and his story are depicted on Heracles' shield. I'm going to read you this passage because it's quite interesting, it's quite old, and also, my god, what a cool shield. There too was the son of rich-haired Danae, the horseman Perseus. His feet did not touch the shield, and yet were not far from it. Very marvellous to remark, since he was not supported anywhere. For so did the famous Hephaestus fashion him of gold with his hands. On his feet he had winged sandals, and his black sheathed sword was slung across his shoulders by a cross belt of bronze. He was flying, swift as thought. The head of a dreadful monster, the Gorgon, covered the broad of his back, and a bag of silver, a marvel to see, contained it. And from the bag bright tassels of gold hung down. Upon the head of the hero lay the dread cap of Hades, which had the awful gloom of night. Perseus himself, the son of Danae, was at full stretch, like one who hurries and shudders with horror. And after him rushed the Gorgons, unapproachable and unspeakable, longing to seize him. 
As they trod upon the pale adamant, the shield rang sharp and clear with a loud clanging. Two serpents hung down at their girdles with heads curved forward, their tongues were flickering and their teeth gnashing with fury and their eyes glaring fiercely. And upon the awful heads of the gorgons, great fear was quaking. Again, quite the intricate shield, quite the depiction of Perseus being chased by these gorgons, which is not something we get in a lot of other sources. It really emphasizes the idea that this was a tragedy for the gorgons. He had killed their sister, and they were going to at least try to do something about it. From here, the story of Perseus and poor Medusa's severed head diverges into two interesting versions, and obviously I'm going to share them both. (laughs) Next week, the story of Andromeda in Ethiopia and her relationship with Perseus, but today, Atlas. Another famous person to live at the edge of the world is, of course, Atlas, the titan whose job it is to hold the heavens on his shoulders. That he lives out that way is standard to these stories, but that he holds the heavens on his shoulders isn't. That lies pretty deeply within Heracles' story. As for Perseus, my beloved Ovid tells the most detailed version of his encounter with Atlas, making the whole notion of it pretty late in the period. But there's a Greek who mentioned it too, though really differently. According to the dithyrambic poet Polydos, mentioned like Pherakides in a later commentary, told the story of Perseus and a man named Atlas, who he encountered shortly after killing Medusa. In this version, Perseus simply passes by a shepherd who happens to be named Atlas and who apparently just questioned Perseus about his identity, which caused Perseus to show him Medusa's head. So yeah, that version is Perseus just murdering another random dude because of a nothing reason. Not ideal. But Ovid's is more interesting. According to Ovid, Perseus encountered the real Atlas, that is, the titan son of Iapetus, on his way back from killing Medusa. First, Perseus was flying back from his encounter, and as he was flying over ancient Libya, broadly just modern North Africa, drops of Medusa's blood fell upon the earth and spawned a bunch of snakes. This, Ovid says, is why the region is infested with snakes? I'm sorry, this episode is just full of random asides because fuck it, all these variations and versions over so many hundreds of years are fascinating as fuck. But beyond the spawning of a bunch of random snakes, Perseus continues on until he reaches the land of Atlas, once more at another furthest western edge of the world. This version of Atlas was still a titan, still son of Iapetus, still enormous like any good titan should be, but he ruled this land as a king, He had thousands of flocks, herds, everything, including the golden apples of the Hesperides, who, according to Ovid and others, lived along with Atlas. Perseus came upon this realm of Atlas and Atlas himself and asked if he could be the Titan's guest. He was tired, he'd traveled so far, plus he'd killed that nice woman who'd done nothing wrong, and so he was awfully exhausted and very excited to have a place to stay there with Atlas. Atlas, though, was not interested in having Perseus stay in his lands. He'd heard a prophecy many years before about a son of Zeus arriving and that that would cause the gold of his land, his apples, to be spoiled, to disappear, leaving his land a much poorer place. To prepare himself against this prophecy, this son of Zeus, Atlas had surrounded his lands with large walls and he'd set this dragon to watch over them to protect him from a son of Zeus. It seems that Perseus got past all of that just fine, I imagine because he was flying and ancient Greek dragons couldn't fly. But regardless, he got as far as to actually ask Atlas for his hospitality and to be rejected. At first, Perseus tried to fight Atlas for his insolence, for not allowing him to be a guest in his lands. But, well, Atlas is a fucking titan, so he quickly realized he was absolutely no match for the man. When this realization hit, Another hit Perseus as well. He now had the ability to win any argument, any fight, in the absolute least fair way possible. So, he held up the head of Medusa before the Titan Atlas, and bam, Atlas was turned to stone. Honestly, these are moments where, like so many other heroes, I do question how heroic they are. 
Medusa's murder aside, you have to think Perseus did a few heroic things. Next week, he'll save Andromeda. He saves his mother from a horrible predator. You know, he does some good. And sure, this is only in Ovid, so we can pretend that in the older ancient Greek sources, Perseus is more explicitly heroic, except for killing Medusa. But still, so much of his heroism is just him possessing a woman's head to use to turn people to stone. Perseus transformed Atlas into stone, and thus... The mythological history behind the Atlas Mountains in Northwest Africa, yes, still called that today, they span Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. At least that bit's cool. Ugh, Perseus, I find myself so torn with you. You're certainly much, much, much better than Theseus or Jason, but are you really a hero in the truest sense of the word? The ancient Greeks would certainly say so. He was one of their most ancient, and so their most important, their founding heroes. And their use of the word is a bit different from ours today, too, which is an interesting piece of this and which often gets forgotten in talk of their so-called heroic actions. In ancient Greece, these heroes protected their lands. They completed quests. They didn't have to be perfect and chivalrous. They just had to do what they'd been instructed to do, keep their lands safe and kill whatever they needed to. All the same, again, Perseus does do some good. It's just that they'll come next week. All the good things he does, including a princess whose heritage is up for debate, but who, in all possible instances, is absolutely not what we would consider today as white. Next week, fucking Andromeda. Oh, 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 thank you all for listening. I really do have so much fun revisiting some of these stories that I covered so very early on the podcast. Honestly, this one I was expecting to be a bit more narrative based, so I apologize for all of the wild variations, but I just think it's so interesting, and I'm just assuming you all want to hear all this crazy shit too, because it's really fucking fascinating. It's incredible to me how much more I know now, how much better I am at finding original sources, and therefore how much more in-depth and accurate my retellings can be. These days, I basically only use primary sources, i.e. writers from antiquity, the ancient world itself, rather than people who were already retelling the stories, as I did with the early days of this podcast. The exception to that is a couple of books that I want to mention because they're really cool. Lately, I've been using as a source, for some episodes at least, a two-volume set of books called Early Greek Myths by Timothy Gantz. Honestly, I don't necessarily recommend them to you all unless you're at the level of nerd I am, plus they're really expensive. They aren't easy to understand retellings, but instead the books explain all the varied sources on each of the myths covered, including visual representations even, which is something lacking in a lot of other places. So it's basically everything I want in order to retell the myths to you guys. And it's the only place I found this Pharakides version of the story today, which is why I'm telling you all of this in the first place. So Pharakides was a mythographer, though he's described then as a historian and genealogist from the 5th century. He seems to have written a very complete account of many of the myths of ancient Greece, similar to Apollodorus, but about four to 500 years earlier. But it's lost. The book entirely is lost. And yet, here I've been referencing him the whole time. How? An ancient source referred to his retellings, his details, and we have that source. An ancient scholiast, someone who was commenting on Pharakides, whose name we don't have, their work survives, where they comment on Pharakides, thus telling us what Pharakides says, and sometimes even with direct quotes. Which is all to say, ancient history and the survival of versions and sources is fucking fascinating. And the more I learn, the more thrilled I am every fucking time. What survives, what doesn't, how, why? Incredible. Anyway, I'm the biggest nerd on this planet. This episode was a little bit wild, but I hope you all enjoyed it. Perseus is really interesting, mostly because of how old he was and thus how much his story varies. Oh, thank you all again. You're all very awesome. Next week, Andromeda, you know, the African or maybe Middle Eastern, I'll explain, princess who married Perseus and thus became the matriarch of an entire fucking dynasty of Greek heroes and characters. Fuck yeah, I am Liv and I, I really love this shit.